determine the clots in the left atria of the patient is transesophageal echocardiography. Transesophageal echocardiography will help in localization of clots in the left atria of the patient and localization of clots in the left atria will ensure the fact that whether we want to give DC cardioversion or not can be controlled. Following atrial fibrillation, the next arrhythmia that we will be discussing is again a supraventricular tachycardia and this supraventricular tachycardia is due to a atrioventricular abnormal conduction via a accessory pathway. Atrioventricular re-entrant tachycardia is a arrhythmia which would be developing due to an accessory pathway present in the heart of the patient and this accessory pathway will be responsible for abnormal conduction from the atria to the ventricles. The condition which I will be describing to you where we will be having atrioventricular re-entry tachycardia would be by the name of Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome is characterized by a presence of an abnormal pathway which would be bypassing the normal conduction system. In you and me, the current starts from SC node, goes to the AV node, then to the bundle of phase and then to the two fascicles. This is the normal passage of current. Once the current goes into the bundle of phase via the network of Purkinje, the current innervates the cardiac muscle. So in you and me, the cardiac muscle gets electronic information via this normal conduction pathway and is responsible for generation of the normal waves in the ECG. However, in patients of Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, there is an abnormal conduction pathway which will directly short circuit this current to the muscle. This abnormal pathway is known as bundle of Kent, which is responsible for transmission of current from the SC node directly to the muscle. This pathway is known as accessory pathway. We are calling it accessory because there are obviously two separate pathways present in the heart. This accessory pathway will result in fast transmission of impulses. So most of these patients would come to you with complaints of palpitations and maybe as an exertional syncope. The usual complaints of patients of WPW would be presence of palpitations. These patients could be having development of syncope during physical activity. There might even be a history of sudden death in maybe a brother or a sister or some sibling related to physical activity because if fast conduction will occur in the heart, it would decrease the cardiac output and would contribute to hemodynamic compromise. Therefore, in all of these patients, for diagnosis of wool parkinson white syndrome, we will have to run the ECG. When we will run the ECG, because in the ECG, PR interval is inversely related to the heart rate, we will always find that all patients of wool parkinson white syndrome will be having a presence of a short PR interval. The second ECG finding in these patients will be related to the QRS complex. Therefore, when you look at the QRS complex of a patient of wool parkinson white syndrome, you will notice the fact that in these patients, in the upswing of the R wave, in the upswing of the R wave, there might be a small change of slope. I'll just enlarge it for you or draw it once again. If you look at, if you look at, let me just try it again. If you look at the upswing of the R wave, you will notice the fact that what I've done in this patient with respect to the R wave is that I have changed the slope and the reason for this change of slope is because of the fact that the current is entering into the heart via the abnormal pathway. Therefore, this abnormal change of slope is known as the delta wave and is seen in the upslope or upswing of the R wave 
and is indicative of the abnormal conduction pathway. For the third ECG finding that is encountered in these patients, we need to remember the following information. If you look at the ECG that I am going to draw before you again, PR interval is from the beginning of P to the beginning of the Q interval, uh, beginning of the Q wave. This is what is known as the PR interval, beginning of P to the beginning of Q. From Q to the end of the S, this is known as the QRS complex. The red point that I have put here before you is technically known as the J point. So what I can say therefore is that the PJ interval, PJ interval is a combination of PR and QRS. PJ interval is a sum of PR and QRS interval. In patients of Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, PR interval becomes short. The reason for this I have already explained to you. A basic law of ECG, PR interval is inversely related to heart rate, tachycardia would imply PR is short. When it comes to QRS, the QRS in patients of Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome is prolonged. The reason why it is prolonged is because of the fact that the conduction in these patients is occurring by the ventricular muscle. There is slow conduction that is occurring via the ventricular muscle of the patient. The conduction is not occurring via the normal conduction pathway but is occurring via the ventricular muscle. Therefore, QRS of the patient is prolonged. Now mathematically it has been seen that the reduction of PR is equal to the prolongation of QRS. Mathematically speaking, if the reduction of PR is equal to the prolongation of QRS, the PJ interval in these patients would remain constant or would remain the same. I said PR is short, QRS prolonged, the reduction of PR is equal to the magnitude of prolongation of QRS. So PJ interval is unchanged or remains normal or same in these patients and therefore the three ECG criteria which are useful for diagnosis of Wolf parkinson white syndrome are a short PR with delta wave and then PJ interval in these patients is normal. For management of these patients, we would ask these patients to avoid competitive sports. This patient is medically unfit with respect to becoming a pilot in the Air Force. He is unfit to become a pilot of a commercial jetliner. He is even unfit to be in, the, let me say, the forces or the armed forces because whenever sympathomimetic stimulation will occur in the heart of the patient, fast conduction through the accessory pathway will bypass the normal conduction pathway. It will increase the heart rate disproportionately and would cause reduction in the duration or diastole of the heart and reduction in the duration or diastole of the heart would result in decrease in cardiac output which would contribute to possibility of death of the patient. Therefore, for these patients, we would tell them that we can put you on drugs. The drugs that have been shown to reduce the conduction via the pathway are drugs like flicanide. Flicanide as a drug reduces the conduction speed via the AP. That is the accessory pathway. When you reduce the conduction speed via the accessory potential, via the accessory pathway, in these patients, the arrhythmia can definitely be prevented. Otherwise, atrial fibrillation of these patients can immediately be converted into a ventricular fibrillation. If you cast a glance at the very diagram that I created here before you, you can also appreciate the fact that if you give a drug to the patient that blocks the AV node, what are the drugs that block the AV node? Drug that can block the AV node can be like digoxin. Drug blocking the AV node can be like adenosine. It could be virapamil. If you are going to block the AV node of the patient using these drugs, then the current will be forced to go via the abnormal pathway. And if the current will go via the abnormal pathway, if you force the current to go only via this pathway, there are higher chances of death of the patient. Therefore, all these drugs 
that are written before you are absolutely contraindicated in patients of WPW, digoxin, adenosine, and virapamil are contraindicated in patients of Wool Parkinson because they will favor conduction via the accessory pathway contributing to death. Now, whether you really got this or not, I can explain this once again, but with a slightly different perspective. I would like you to spot the differences in the sketch that I created earlier before you and the one that I'm making right now. The current in the heart goes from SA node to AV node, then to the bundle of his, then to the Purkinje fiber, and then the current goes into the cardiac muscle. So our heart will be getting electrical current via the pathway that I have created here before you. But this patient that I have drawn before you will be having an accessory pathway. The accessory pathway will allow short circuit of current by passing the AV node. AV node exhibits a property that is known as AV nodal delay. And this AV nodal delay is usually up to something like 0.1 second. I can therefore say that there is wastage of 0.1 second when the current goes via the AV node. But if the current will bypass the AV node and directly go into the bundle of phase, we would be short saving on time. And when you save on time, the heart rate would definitely be accelerated. This particular condition that I made about before you is different from Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. In Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, the conduction pathway was directly going into the ventricular muscle. But this particular time, if you cast a glance at the color purple in the slide, you can see that the current is bypassing only the AV node but is not going into the muscle but is going back into the bundle of his only. The disease is known as Laun Genong Levine syndrome. Even in this condition, we are having accessory pathway. And I presume that you would be knowing the name of this accessory pathway in Laun Genong Levine syndrome. In Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, it was bundle of Kent. But in these patients, the conduction pathway is known as James Bundle. The conduction fibers are also known as Maheim fibers. So James Bundle and Maheim fibers are the ones which would be responsible for conduction of current with respect to Long Long Levine syndrome. These patients would also come to your hospital with complaints of palpitations. These patients would also come to your hospital with complaints of syncope and could also be presenting a sudden death. However, in all of these patients, if you do the ECG, the ECG of these patients will definitely be showing a short PR interval. The reason for short PR interval will be fast conduction from the atria to the ventricles. But then the current is coming directly to the bundle of his. It is not going into the muscle. In Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, the current was going in the muscle. But here the current is not going in the muscle directly into the conduction system. So QRS will mostly be normal or it can be even reduced or narrow because of faster conduction occurring into the bundle of phase of the patient. Therefore, mathematically speaking, I can say that PJ interval, which is the sum of PR plus QRS, will be exhibiting the following details. PR is narrow, QRS will either be narrow or will be normal. So the final result would be PJ would be short. And therefore, PJ interval is useful for differentiating between Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome versus Long levine syndrome because of the fact that in Long long levine syndrome, PJ interval is short, whereas in WPW it is normal. Even for management of these patients, the drug used can be flicanide or we can even use procainamide for these patients. But if they ask you the treatment of choice for these patients, then the treatment of choice for any patient with accessory pathway. It could be Wolf-Parkinson-White. It could be Long Genong Levine. Treatment of choice for any patient with accessory pathway should always be answered as radio frequency ablation. This radio frequency ablation 
would help in termination of the arrhythmia because you would be causing complete ablation of the accessory pathway which is present in the heart of the patient and therefore is the treatment of choice for management of these patients. For the remaining series, we shall be continuing. Iske break dena, Thank you. Thank you.